Welcome to the Cute Dog Bible Study with Dr. Randy Ream, Senior Pastor of Stony Creek Church in Utica, Michigan, bringing you Lesson 5. Are you feeling restless during this COVID-19 quarantine? Ironically, though many are off work and at home, I hear a lot about feelings of restlessness. People are confined to their homes, not able to participate in their regular activities. They're feeling stir-crazy, anxious, and ill at ease. True, we may have some extra time on our hands, but when you can't go out to eat at a restaurant or play or watch sports or meet with a group of more than a handful of people, it leaves a big gap. You can have less to do and still feel restless, am I right? Rest is not just absence of activity, it's also a state of mind and a state of soul. Today's lesson is called Dog Tired. It's about rest for the restless. Our dog for this week's lesson is Zoe Hope Johnson Bordeaux, but we'll call her Zoe for short, if that's okay by you, Zoe Hope Johnson Bordeaux. Good girl. But Zoe looks like she could use some rest. Here's Zoe mixing it up with Roxy Lloyd. See, the stress of quarantine is getting to them. The first mention of rest in the Bible is about God resting, not humans. After six days of work creating the universe, we're told by the seventh day, God had finished the work he had been doing. So on the seventh day, he rested from all his work. Then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. That's Genesis 2, verses 2 and 3. Notice carefully that God both blesses the seventh day and calls it holy. So far, in all God's work of creating, he has only blessed the living creatures in the sky and water, in Genesis 1.22, and then the crown of his creation, human beings, male and female, in chapter 1, verse 26. He's declared all of his creation very good, Genesis 1.31. But only these living creatures are said to receive his blessing. Sorry, Zoe, nothing about dogs. But when it comes to making something holy, the seventh day is the first and only thing so far that gets that privilege. Not the seas, not the land, not the trees, not the vegetation, the beasts, the insects, the birds, the sea creatures, the stars, the sun or moon. No, not even human beings are declared holy. Only the seventh day is made holy in God's creation. Holy means to be set apart by God for special use. If you have a really nice suit that you set apart for only the most special occasions, or a set of dishes that you otherwise keep in a very safe place, that's what God is doing with the seventh day. He's setting it apart for his special use. Immediately, we think of other things God later makes holy, especially the holy place in the tabernacle or the temple, and especially the most holy place where God's active presence, his Shekinah glory cloud rested, the place no one but the high priest could enter. And even he could only do so once a year on the Day of Atonement, with the blood shed for his sins and for the sins of Israel. But back here in Genesis 2, God is making the seventh day his most holy place, as it were. The special time where he dwells and rests to enjoy his creation. Similar to how you might sit down and enjoy and admire the paint job or the yard work you just finished. This is God's special time, his time to relax, as it were, his time to enjoy the work he's completed. He feels that sense of satisfaction and infinite joy in the work he's done, and he says, this is my special time. 
Zoe can relate. Enjoy it, Zoe. We hear nothing more about the seventh day until later in history, when God enters into a special covenant relationship with his chosen people, Israel. As a hallmark of this relationship, God invites them to enjoy this time with him, to enter into his rest every seventh day. He calls it the Sabbath, which means seventh in Hebrew. The fourth commandment puts it this way, Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. That's Exodus 20, verses 8 through 10. Please look carefully at the wording here. The word remember first. That's the Hebrew word uh, that means to call to mind. And more than that, it's more than just recollect. It also means to observe, to practice. In other words, the Sabbath must be observed as an event, not just called to mind, not just recalled, but practiced. Secondly, the words keeping it holy. Israel is to keep this day holy, to regard it as special, just as God does. And then third, the words a Sabbath to the Lord your God. This day of rest is declared by Yahweh to be directed to himself. Astounding. Israel here is being invited into God's holy time, his special time, to enjoy it with him. It wasn't simply a day off from work. No, it was a day to spend time enjoying the Lord. God is, as it were, inviting Israel into his most holy place. He's saying, I want to enjoy you, and I want you to be refreshed and enjoy me. No wonder the Sabbath was to be the distinguishing mark that set Israel apart from all the other nations. It was the identifying sign that you belong to the one true God. And appropriately so. It was a sign of a close relationship with God in his presence, enjoying his people as they enjoy him, a place of genuine rest and refreshment. But as wonderful as this seventh day special time with God was, it was only a signpost for the real thing that God intended for his people. Not just one day in seven, but every day, all day. The Sabbath was only a shadow of the reality to come later. And that reality was not a day of the week, but God himself, his actual person embodied in Jesus Christ, Yahweh himself in human flesh. Jesus, if you recall, said he came to fulfill God's law. Look it up. It's in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. You say, oh yeah, that means that Jesus fulfilled the animal sacrifices prescribed in the law when he died on the cross and then later rose from the dead to save us. Yes, that, that's true. But there's much more to it than just that. You see, Jesus fulfills all of the law, every part of it. It all points to him, including the Sabbath. The Sabbath was the signpost, but Jesus is the reality that the sign points to. In the Apostle Paul's day, some non-Jewish people who were following Jesus wondered if they had to keep the Jewish dietary rules and festivals and the Sabbath prescribed in the law, what we call the Old Testament. Paul says no, because if you have Jesus, you have what these signposts point to. 
He writes about it in Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. He says that these, these signposts, are a shadow of the things to come. But the body that casts the shadow belongs to Christ. Imagine you haven't seen a loved one for a long time. You miss him so much and you just can't wait to see him. But then when he walks off the plane, do you fall down on his shadow and kiss the shadow? <laughs> of course not. The shadow is nothing compared to the substance. Jesus is the body that casts the shadow. We embrace him now that he's come. The weekly Sabbath is no longer needed. It might be a good idea to rest on the seventh day, wonderful, but it's not required. We now have the Sabbath with us 24-7. Jesus is our Sabbath. If you have Jesus, you have what the Sabbath in the Old Testament pointed to. Look at how Jesus put it in Matthew chapter 11, beginning at verse 28. He said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you, because I am humble and gentle at heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. I wish I had a lot of time to unpack this powerful passage. Jesus here is claiming to be the rest to which the seventh day Sabbath only pointed and gave a foretaste of. Notice, he says, take my yoke upon you. The rabbis referred to God's law, the law of Moses, as a yoke. But here, Jesus says, exchange that yoke for me, because I provide everything to which the law pointed. In following the story, as you continue in the Gospel of Matthew, you go into chapter 12, where Jesus' disciples are wrongly accused by the Pharisees of breaking the Sabbath for snacking on some uh, heads of grain as they walk through a field. After Jesus corrects the Pharisees, he makes this astounding remark. Look at it. Matthew 12, verse 8. He says, For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Astounding. Astounding. Only God could say that. Imagine a bookshelf. This statement here in Matthew 12, 8, this statement is the back bookend. Jesus' remark about coming to him for rest back in chapter 11, well, that's the front bookend. And the story in between about the disciples picking the grain on the Sabbath, that's meant to illustrate that if you have Jesus, you have the real Sabbath. But as neat as these observations are, please don't miss the impact of Jesus' astounding words. I will give you rest, and you will find rest for your souls. Does that sound appealing to you? This is not mere bodily rest, as good and important as that is. This is the rarer still rest of the soul, deep refreshing, lasting rest. I can't think of anything more appealing. And where is this profound rest to be found? Jesus says, come to me and I will give you rest. Rest is found in him, not in a place, not in a vacation spot, not in a rest area or your favorite chair, <laughs> nice as all those things may be. But the ultimate rest is in Jesus himself, God's most holy place, where you meet with him. He enjoys you, and you enjoy him. And get this, this invitation includes the hard cases, 
This is not just for the person who's a little bit tired out. It's also for those of us who are really whipped and discouraged and thoroughly exhausted, about to give up. Notice, he says, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. That's for you, Jesus says. That's for you. All you have to do is come to him. Well, let me give you some Sabbath suggestions. Go to Jesus constantly throughout your day for rest. You can meet him anywhere. You can meet him in your mind. You can just appeal to him wherever you are, whatever you're doing. Next, set apart a holy time to meet with God. Next, turn your time with God into a holy sanctuary of rest. Next, bring worship and psalm reading to God into your sanctuary. Next, keep a journal of your prayers and thoughts. Or how about try next, uh, taking time to listen for God's voice during your Sabbath rest. That's important too. Not just to uh, let talk to him, but for him to talk to you. Next, take a day, maybe in part or if you can, in whole, to spend a day with the Lord in his word and prayer. Next, Fast for 24 hours to remind you of the need to desire God more than you desire food. Next, turn off your electrical, electronic devices during your prayer time, during your Bible time. Don't let yourself be interrupted. And then finally, ask the Lord to give you rest and expect him to do so. He did, after all, promise it. Well, that's our cute dog Bible study for this week. If you enjoyed it, please let me know and share it with someone else. Also, if you liked it, give it a rating on Facebook. This helps more people to see it. Do you have a cute dog? Would you like your dog to show up on an upcoming episode of the cute dog Bible study? Well, if so, here's what to do. First, send video clips of your cute dog to me via Facebook Messenger. Second, make sure they're up close, individual action shots that last no more than five seconds or so. Next, please tilt your phone on the side so that we get a wide angle shot. And then finally, please limit to five clips per dog along with several still shots. I could really use for an upcoming episode some feisty dog shots. So if you got those, those are great. My disclaimer, I can't guarantee I'll use your stuff, but I'll do my best. Goodbye and God bless you.